Next, our next discussion uh, is will be joined by Mr. Kent Rowinger from ATK. Uh, it will be sponsored by Liberty. The Mr. Kent Rowinger is a five-time NASA, NASA shuttle astronaut uh, veteran, as well as having flown two as the mission commander, logging over 1,600 hours of uh, space travel. And well, I'm pleased to have us him join us for this uh, great discussion on this new exciting thing. So, we welcome to the stage. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. And, and I have one goal today. <clears throat> and my goal today is to just inform people what liberty is, what it's all about. And I think the best way for me to do that uh, is I've got some slides. I've got 30 minutes. And by the way, I was planning on uh, using no more than 20 minutes uh, for me to talk. And then what I would love is to field questions from the audience. Uh, because in inevitably, I'm not very good at picking out all the areas of interest to the folks. So I've got some slides that hopefully will help you uh, come up with questions, uh, because I would love to address any questions. And, and feel free uh, to ask any question you like. Matter of fact, a lot of times I tell folks, hey, you, you can't hurt my feelings. If you're thinking there, if there's a tough question, or if, or if it appears that I said something that you just know is flat not true, call me out. Say, so, you no, know, that can't be right. You, you said this and this, and that just doesn't sound right. Uh, I'd love to have that kind of discussion with you so we can, we can further understand liberty. So with that, I've, I've got a video I'm going to start out with. It's just about a 60-second video to help kind of visually show us uh, the liberty system. And so this is kind of currently where we stand on liberty today. And also, it's not all that far from our starting point with liberty. It looks like we didn't get the, the sound. Now we've got it. Thanks. So that was pretty fast and furious. Uh, but what that tried to show is with Liberty, we do have hardware. And so the, the first stage, the five segment booster, has been test fired three times. The second stage is the core of the Ariane 5 that's flying today. Obviously, it needs some modification for us to put it on as a second stage. And then you saw the composite pressure cell on our capsule, the composite crew capsule uh, that we're flying as our, our system on Liberty. And uh, what wasn't on there was the abort system on top, MLAS. And, and given the time I had today, I, I kind of didn't put a lot on the abort system in there. But if you're curious at the end, we can go into that as well. Uh, so with Liberty, it's a complete system. And I say Liberty. The rocket's Liberty. The capsule's Liberty. The team is Liberty. But ultimately, the service, the entire service is Liberty. So we control the manufacturing, the integration, the, all the hardware. But the reality of it is the, the customers. We're providing the service to the customers. And obviously, NASA and commercial crew is one of those. But we are targeting other customers as well, uh, from some of the countries like Brazil, Costa Rica, Australia, India, to name a few that we've been in touch with. Because they do have interests in flying astronauts from their countries for their nation uh, on a system like Liberty can provide. Uh, the team of Liberty, and uh, real quickly, you saw some of the larger suppliers show up on the list, which Astrium, uh, to the tune of 120,000 folks, is on our team. Lockheed Martin, uh, I like to tease them as my little subcontractor doing my spacecraft for me. Uh, but along with it, we've got Moog, Hamilton Sunstrand, Honeywell, Aerojet, uh, L3 Communications. 
who am I forgetting? And, and in, your, in your mind, you, you're probably thinking dollar bills. When you start, when I start ta ATK, when we start talking about companies like that, a lot of times you may be thinking, hey, this, this is probably going to be a very expensive service to buy, a rocket to buy, and it's not. And so I'll get into that later with you all, but uh, if, if I didn't, well, hopefully that planted a question uh, that we can talk more on it. Uh, so my workforce, I would submit, is probably the most experienced. As a, the team, our team on Liberty, has got to be, if not the one of the most experienced in the world when it comes to putting crews into space. Uh, so obviously, if there's anybody here from uh, from the Russians, uh, they might stand up and, and claim otherwise. Uh, but for I guess commercial space is really in text how I to say that. Uh, the other one is rapid execution. I'm going to fly my first test crew in in late 2015, and that's another one too where people will say, "Now, now, come on, your rocket's never flown, you, you've never integrated it." You have a, a capsule that is effectively new. How are you standing here today in 2012 with a straight face going to tell me that you can fly a crew in 2015? And so here's the reason. Here's how I can do it in 2015. Uh, a little bit of it is my team has past performance. And I'm sure you're immediately going, hey, wait a minute, your team? Uh, the uh, eight of my integration folks on Liberty uh, came from Lockheed Martin. They came to us about six years ago uh, to include the launch director that launched the first Atlas V. So these folks grew up in the integration world, in the Titan world, and then the Atlas world. And on the Atlas V, they basically were given, from the time they said go, they successfully launched that vehicle three and a half years later. So if you look at what we're, do what we're doing with Liberty, I'm about a quarter of a year more aggressive than that three and a half. Uh, but my starting point is is further along. So the first stage is, is the CDR level. It's, it's actually ready to fly. Uh, the second stage has been flying as a core. I've got an air light, that second stage, that Vulcan 2 motor, which interestingly enough, uh, in technical meetings uh, just a week before last in France, uh, the, the SNECMA folks are pretty convinced the existing igniter will light it uh, on in orbit which is kind of amazing. If, if you come from the, the world that I grew up in with NASA and the SSMEs on the space shuttle, air starting those is a major undertaking. In the case of the Vulcan 2, it's a simple gas generator design engine. Uh, its little brother is their upper stage now that air lights successfully, uh, for, it has for hundreds of times. So we are developing a little bit different igniter. It's a little bit longer, more capable. We don't think we're gonna need it. Uh, what I do have to do is make sure I have that engine conditioned, that it's in the start box. And so during first stage now, for those first couple of minutes, I've got to do the same conditioning on that engine that it's provided on the ground. I just continue that uh, during space flight. Uh, but we're well underway to, to that. Uh, the other thing with the second stage is on the Ariane 5 as the core, that stage is lifted. It's actually lifted into the air because it has a couple of strap-on solids on the side of it and the thrust takeout is at the top of that stage. Uh, I guarantee you, sitting on top of my 3.6 million thrust uh, engine, uh, it is not being lifted, it is being shoved, it's being pushed into the air. So what that means is structure-wise, uh, I've gotta have a thicker tank uh, structure than it is on the Ariane 5. Astrium, uh, just three weeks ago, completed the initial testing on the structure. And the, and the great news is their existing tooling in France uh, will, will produce my tank right in line with their tanks uh, without any major modifications. So, so that's all going great on the second stage. Uh, now we get to the, the capsule. Uh, and so capsules, uh, even though compared to something like the space shuttle are relatively simple, are still very complicated. And whenever you put humans on anything, uh, they're very, very thorough. Uh, I have the luxury, uh, along with Liberty, of first of all, thanking NASA uh, for when commercial crew was selected and rolled out, uh, NASA said, okay, industry, we want Leo, you, we want you to take over Leo. We want to depend on you to getting us to and from space station, and we don't want to be your only customers, right? We want you to have a business that will close on its own. Uh, so we will help with some funding uh, for those that are selected, but also what we'll do is we've got five decades worth of experience intellectual property that's available to you. 
So industry, you're welcome to come and get it. Uh, it's really the taxpayers that paid for it. So anything we have, you know, that the taxpayers have, have paid for, we will make available to you. Uh, and NASA has been very good in that. As a matter of fact, I have Space Act agreements with eight of their centers. Uh, the first stage, obviously, NASA developed uh, that hardware that's being accessed. We're getting our hands on. Uh, the second stage, the European Space Agency developed that for the Ariane 5. Uh, we're leveraging all the investment that went into that. But kind of like the first stage, uh, my capsule, the, uh, the composite crew capsule we'll get into later. But, but the reality of it is we industry, ATK, being one of those partners, have been working with NASA since 2007 on that composite pressure shell. And we're also leveraging a, a lot of the work that NASA and Lockheed are doing on Orion. My next Chevron here says safest system available. Uh, this is what I'm passionate about. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about it is I was uh, the chief of the astronaut office when Columbia didn't return home. And it became very evident to us that, you know, uh, the space shuttle is phenomenal. Nothing has ever done what it has been able to do as far as taking payload to orbit and bringing payload back home and being reusable like it is. So it truly, truly is phenomenal. It also, though, when we sat down uh, as an office and looked at and started doing the math, we realized if things didn't change significantly, we would run out of space shuttles uh, before, we, before we wanted to. And the fact is, it just was not a safe enough vehicle uh, for the long haul, which made us realize we need a replacement. And by the way, we're in the 21st century. We're good enough to have a replacement that is a magnitude, an order of magnitude safer than what we have today. Uh, Liberty meets that. It absolutely meets that. So NASA's human rating requirements, their standards, their certification process that we have not yet seen, but I expect to see rolled out in about a month or so. Uh, with Liberty, I know no reason why I cannot meet all those stringent requirements because it, it was designed from inception. Every major element that has been designed from inception to meet NASA's requirements. So now you may have a question, hey, but wait a minute, you have a European second stage, and you said your system was designed to meet NASA's human rating requirements. And what I will tell you is when the European Space Agency developed the Ariane 5, it was developed to lift the Hermes space plane. And although to the letter of the law, they did not put NASA's requirements as their requirements, they had NASA's human rating requirements and, and developed that system uh, with the intent of meeting NASA's human rating requirements or something very close thereto. Business case. You know, this, this is liberty as a commercial endeavor. And so that business case is probably the biggest bullet on there. If, if we don't have a system that's competitive and will keep us in business, then none of the other things matter. The fact that it could be the safest vehicle ever designed, that doesn't matter. What matters is you have to have an offer and you have to provide a service that's competitive and has a very strong business case, and, and Liberty does. And the fact is, uh, when you look at the commercial com crew providers out there, Liberty is one of them that now we control the entire stack. So all the hardware, the, the service, Crew is our first launch, but we also are going after cargo and satellites. And uh, the Liberty has a real great sweet spot for large payloads to LEO. The, the fact of the matter is there aren't that many large payloads that need to go to LEO, although, although there are some. Uh, GEO, GTO uh, is also an area that we are looking at, and we're developing a third stage uh, for the GTO, GEO market as well. So a few key attributes, and some of these are already keyed on, uh, but the, the fact is human, when it comes to human rating, uh, I believe this is a, a true discriminator for liberty, the, the fact that we have designed it for that. Part of what you do, if you sit down and look at saying, how do I come up with a system that's the safest, uh, most reliable there is? And the very first thing you do is you make it simple. You try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, and if you look at our past and where failures have happened, one of the things that drives failures in the past is if a system is kind of complicated. 
and you can have interactions between the systems. Challenger. Challenger is a prime example. Uh, our solid rocket motor uh, had a leak in one of the joints. Uh, it severed the strut on the system, and it was a very bad day. Had that happened as an in line, say that was a, a joint on Liberty, uh, and by the way, that joint's been redesigned, and we've got 221 flights showing that uh, our system joints are, are very robust. But had that, that same event happened on a system that wasn't as complicated like Liberty, uh, chances are we would have never even known we had a problem until we recovered that first stage. Uh, it would not have resulted in a catastrophe. Uh, same with Columbia. You know, look at Columbia and say, what happened here? Well, the fact is the tank, the liquid tank shed foam, and it was the interaction of the shedding off of that tank that hit the leading edge. We didn't fully appreciate uh, what that meant to us. Uh, and again, it resulted in a very bad day because of the interactions from a system that was, was not as simple as maybe uh, there others are out there. So Liberty being very, very simple, one engine on first stage, one engine on second stage, you know, obviously just that one staging event, uh, and now you're in orbit. In addition to that, you need a very robust abort system, a crew escape system, which we've got. Cost competitive. So here's one where, where I'm thinking, you know, maybe I could get some questions because uh, Liberty is, is very, very capable. As a matter of fact, uh, the rocket lifts 44,000 pounds into a space station orbit, uh, uh, which I believe is probably the largest. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we can lift all the other commercial capsules out there and, and would love to do such uh, with our great lift, lift capability. So given the size of our rocket and the lift capability, uh, how can we be competitive? One of the ways is we, we launch the largest volume capsule to the tune of, I think, 690 cubic feet uh, inside. Not all that is usable, but just uh, pressurized volume space. Uh, so we can carry seven crew, uh, and uh, by offering seven crew, you, you obviously get more per crew. But in addition to that, uh, our second service module will carry a significant amount of cargo. I've got a picture of that coming up, which helps a lot, because it just doesn't cost me that much more to carry the cargo, but it's a great benefit to show up at a station, uh, whether it's the NASA space station or a commercial space station, now, with the crew and the cargo that they need to the tune of 5,000 pounds, that really helps the business case. But, but there's one other thing on here, too, and you're probably looking at the chart, streamlined. Uh, what we've done at ATK over the past 18 months is we took a look at our factory and realized that it was not operating very efficiently. Uh, and NASA, by the way, uh, with NASA's help, uh, we made over 400 changes to procedures uh, NASA's credit, they bought off on every one of them. But there were instances where a piece of hardware might move 40 something times. Uh, we were able to reduce that down into a single digit number of times uh, for efficiencies. So we figured out how to gain efficiencies. Uh, for me in Liberty, I'm given the, the manufacturing plant one tenth the number of requirements uh, that they're used to or that they would have, uh, say, for the, for the NASA motor. Uh, and part of that is it's, it has to do with a commercial set of rules. Uh, and we actually at ATK make motors commercially and sell them to folks such as ULA, Orbital. Uh, and we, we know the commercial world and the bureaucracy is, is a fraction of what it can be in others. And that equates in big savings. And a lot of the savings come from schedule, which in turn means you don't have the manpower uh, on the hook for as much time, which is the money savings. Uh, simple design I talked about in the performance margin. Uh, the performance margin is key in me making my launch schedule dates. Uh, because of the, the margin, the, the extra launch lift capability I've got, I have the luxury of, as an example, on my capsule, I'm just flying the existing uh, heat shield uh, that Orion has been developed and certified for Orion. It's thicker and heavier than I need, but it actually, when you look at it, it gives me a safety margin, and now I don't have to take any time or expense uh, for the certification of that heat shield. I can lift it. My composite pressure shell, I'm making it heavier and thicker than I would have to. 
I'm also instrumenting it to make sure I, I totally understand it. But rather than going with a little bit, uh, thank you, uh, 10 minutes, so I'm gonna get to questions here quickly. With a little bit quicker design, uh, I had the luxury of making it more robust. The amount of testing I have to do ahead of time, the amount of data I'm required to collect or have to collect is less as well, and that all helps my schedule. So here is the pressure shell, the, the lower right uh, portion of that, uh, that was just taken a month ago with that composite crew module going into a vacuum chamber for permeability testing at the Marshall Space Flight Center. And by the way, that, that's NASA and the industry team that's doing that testing on that composite pressure shell. Uh, I'm leveraging that work. We ATK manufactured that back in 2009. Uh, you know, seven crew, even a toilet. Uh, and actually a toilet's a big deal, I can tell you as a crew member, that uh, that comes in very handy. You, you need a fairly good sized capsule to uh, provide all those uh, amenities. I want to get to questions. Here's my block two service module. So the first one I fly will not have the capability to carry a pressurized cargo module, but in the upper left-hand quadrant, you can see it's a miniature MPLM, or as NASA calls it, the uh, modular logistics module. Uh, it's about a third the size of the one the space shuttle carry, but it, it's the same concept. Uh, Liberty shows up at space station, uh, the ISS uses a robotic arm to pull it out, made it to space station, uh, unload racks that will go through the four-foot opening. Uh, so not only seven crew, but <clears throat> in my block two, I can bring 5,000 pounds of, of supplies along with that crew. So, you know, in summary, and I want to get to questions here because I'm down under 10 minutes. Hey, at Liberty, we're committed. Uh, we want to provide our nation with the best capability possible. We want to bring a new launch capability to the U.S. We believe, we absolutely believe we can be competitive. Uh, we're going to start flight testing in 2014. First crew launch, November of 15. Uh, we are leveraging many, many lessons learned in addition to all the streamlining and given the new set of commercial rules we've got are really moving out. But my, my final uh, slide here is, th the fact is, regardless of who provides the, the service force of a nation, uh, here's what it's really all about. My fondest dream is becoming an astronaut. I will see space and planets. I will hear the countdown clock. I will taste astronaut food on a mission. I will touch the controls. I will smell space. Inside I will feel happy and excited. I wrote this poem. Test, test. Hey, mine works now. Sorry about that. You say safety is a priority concern. Uh, of my background is working on ships as a marine engineer. We wouldn't go up to, out to sea without a workshop or some way to do in situ repairs. And we've, humans have a forgetful memory of lessons learned. And uh, I don't know how far you propose to go with that as you set up the space, the International Space Station or what because I have a patent for uh, repairing in situ in space. You might want to come see me after. So, thank you, I, I will. In, in our, our design is to do everything we can to design in the, the, the reliability requirements that we need. Sometimes that's through redundancy. Matter of fact, many times it's done through redundancy. Uh, other times it's done through high reliability. Our, our goal is you know, to, to be able to sustain failures and still complete the mission at the very least, uh, make sure we get the crew back on Earth. Because that is one of the diff big differences is, you know, with, when you're flying humans with that payload, uh, some people say, hey, wait a minute, we launch payloads that are worth billions of dollars, almost priceless, and, and absolutely. And you, you dearly want those payloads to get into their orbit. On the other hand, if we're launching cr crew members, uh, getting them into orbit is not the priority. 
the priority is getting them back on the earth safely. That's the number one priority. And they're very different. without some facility that do in situ repairs. Yeah, yeah, okay. so thank you. Yeah. Well, I better ask a question. What's your per seat price for the launch? You have no, no indication of price yet. And uh, second, what's in it for the European government, if any, in, in, now that it's a US-European program, effectively, uh, what are they after in this deal? Yeah, okay, great question. The first one, price per seat, uh, all I can tell you is it's significantly less than what NASA's paying for a seat now. Uh, we're still in the middle of a competition, uh, but I think people will be very pleasantly surprised when they see our price per seat. Uh, once we start flying cargo too, our, our combination of, of crew and cargo, uh, I think will be extremely competitive. Uh, second of all, the European government, uh, when we started this project, we contacted the European Space Agency and said, hey, we want to talk to one of your manufacturers. Uh, what do you think? They said, great, go for it. Uh, we talked to Ariana Spas, who, who sells the Ariane 5 system. Uh, they said, hey, this is great. Uh, the contractor's Astrium that builds it. That's who we're teamed with. So uh, technically, legally, right now, what Europe gets out of it, I think, is nothing other than part of our system, our U.S. system. Uh, well, I guess what we get out of it is President Obama, a couple of years ago, when he rolled out his space policy, he had a couple of major changes. One of them was expand international cooperation. So we are helping that with this project with folks that have proven to be very good partners on space station. Five minutes, thanks. Uh, yeah. You made it sound like Liberty is a standalone company almost, at least in, in what I heard when you started off. So is Liberty going to be a, a, a separate profit center from ATK? Is it a spin-off? Will it be separate, et cetera? Could you talk about that? Yes. Uh, starting out uh, right now, it's ATK. Uh, we, we've actually, that, that's one where we've been uh, kind of all over the map. Uh, right now, with the ICAP competition going on, if we receive a, a full award, if you will, on ICAP, it will probably remain ATK uh, because we ATK uh, see this. It's been interesting as it's evolved, but ATK sees this as a very uh, strong business case, and we ATK will put significant amount of cash into it on our own. If the award is, is less than that, now we're going to look very hard at turning it into a Liberty Corporation in which case we'd approach equity investors or, or debt investors. And now, as a corporation, it would wind up with uh, some investment. So the, the real answer is don't know. It depends. We'll have to see uh, what funding comes. Question over here. Oh, yes. Sorry. We'll get over, come to you next. What are the primary difference, differences, if any, between the five-segment booster you've got there and the one you're going to be building for uh, SLS? Very little. Uh, so, the, so the fact is, right now, SLS, the first two test flights, that segment is strapped on the side. Ours is in line, so it'll have a nose cone. Uh, ours is expended, uh, as it is on SLS, interestingly, so we don't carry the chutes or have that extra 12 feet of length in there for that. Uh, but, but the grain design, uh, in, the, in my commercial world, I'm not changing a thing. I don't have to. So they are very, very similar. So, Rand, yeah. So the, the question is, hey, what happens to my cost structure if SLS is canceled? And thank you. That, that's a great question because there are synergies, right, which obviously implies Liberty, I can offer at a lower price with SLS. Uh, the timing is such, uh, as long as NASA proceeds with the two test flights on SLS that are, we're on contract for now, uh, and Liberty kicks off with an ICAP award, Liberty will be up and operating well that if SLS, if the follow-on booster competition doesn't include the five segment, our costs will go up slightly, but it's actually not that great. Uh, so we have, we have made our plant efficient. We, we will size it to the production that it needs uh, with these efficiencies. So 
we actually at Liberty do fine up and running uh, without SLS. And part of the reason is a lot of this hardware that, that NASA has for both systems, as a matter of fact, is being excess. So, so the hardware is there. And now it's a matter of up operating the plant at an efficiency level for uh, a rate up here or a rate here. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com. I was just uh, curious with uh, uh, the, that international partnership, what challenges uh, you see, or what the biggest challenge you see in terms of integration with the upper stage, uh, the core stage uh, are, and how you expect to either address those through, through uh, hardware fittings, you know, how, how you see that whole process coming together. So, yeah, thank you. You know, when I went into this, I thought one of my biggest challenges would be ITAR, which are the rules levied on me working with a, a, a foreign national and particularly sending things their way. It took us a little while to get through the initial agreement. Since then, we've had the modifications. That's actually gone very well. Uh, coming the other way, out of Europe into the U.S., they have similar uh, ITAR. They don't call it ITAR, but they have similar export regulations and rules. Uh, those are different from ours. And so uh, about a year ago, uh, we realized we didn't fully appreciate those. We had a little bit of a setback. It cost us a couple of months uh, on working through it. So we've been working through those. Uh, since then, EADS North America has been very involved with us, uh, and they're based on the East Coast. So they very much understand all these rules, and, and it's been a great relationship. Uh, once we're up at operational rates, which to me, I'm saying the operational rate is around four to six missions per year. Uh, EADS North America is looking at bringing the manufacturing to that second stage into the U.S., which will really help me. Uh, today, that stage is built in France, and then it's shipped uh, to the equator in Karoo. Uh, so it actually will have a shorter trip coming into Kennedy. Uh, so, so the transportation is all being demonstrated today. Integration-wise, matter of fact, in the last three weeks, uh, we've had two face-to-face -face meetings, one in Florida, one in France with our partners, uh, working really, really well together. So I, I've been very pleasantly surprised with how well this transatlantic uh, relationship is going. And again, EADS North America has been somewhat key in helping making sure we understand each other well. Yes, over here. The schedules you're talking about, uh, assuming a fully funded CCI cap award, and if you get something less than that, what happens to your schedule? Yeah, my schedule slips right. Uh, as a matter of fact, on ICAP, we were asked, hey, if you don't get full funding, if it's, uh, I guess, basically two-thirds of that, what happens to your schedule? And as I recall, my schedule went out about seven months, uh, so with a two-thirds funding to the right. So uh, before I was ready to fly NASA crews, so I I think I still met flying a NASA crew in 2016, uh, but, but anyway, about eight months for that. And proportionally, uh, proportionally from there, it just continues to go out further to the right with less funding. Zero. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I, I really appreciate the time. Great questions. And uh, real quickly, you saw some of the larger suppliers show up on the list, which Astrium, uh, to the tune of 120,000 folks, is on our team. Lockheed Martin, uh, I like to tease them as my little subcontractor doing my spacecraft for me. Uh, but along with it, we've got Moog, Hamilton Sunstrand, Honeywell, Aerojet, uh, L3 Communications. Who am I forgetting? And in, 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 your, in your mind, you, you're probably thinking dollar bills. When you start, when I start ta ATK, when we start talking about companies like that, a lot of times you may be thinking, hey, this, this is probably going to be a very expensive service to buy, a rocket to buy, and it's not. And so I'll get into that later with you all, but uh, if, if I didn't, well, hopefully that planted a question uh, that we can talk more on it. Uh, so my workforce... I would submit is probably the most experienced as the team, our team on Liberty has got to be, if not the one of the most experienced in the world when it comes to putting crews into space. Now, 
all the areas of interest to the folks. So I've got some slides that hopefully will help you uh, come up with questions uh, because I would love to address any questions. And feel free uh, to ask any question you like. Matter of fact, a lot of times I tell folks, hey, you, you can't hurt my feelings. If you're thinking there, if there's a tough question, or if, or if it appears that I said something that you just know is flat not true, call me out. Say, no, that can't be right. You, you said this and this, and that just doesn't sound right. Uh, I'd love to have that kind of discussion with you so we can, we can further understand liberty. So with that, I've, I've got a video I'm going to start out with. It's just about a 60-second video to help kind of visually show us uh, the liberty system. And so this is kind of currently where we stand on liberty today. And also, it's not all that far from our starting point with liberty. It looks like we didn't get today. Obviously, it needs some modification for us to put it on as a second stage. And then you saw the composite pressure cell on our capsule, the composite crew capsule uh, that we're flying as our, our system on Liberty. And uh, what wasn't on there was the abort system on top, MLAS. And, and given the time I had today, uh, I kind of didn't put a lot on the abort system in there. But if you're curious at the end, we can go into that as well. Uh, so with Liberty, it's a complete system. And I say Liberty. The rocket's liberty, the capsule's liberty, the team is liberty, but ultimately the service, the entire service is liberty. So we control the manufacturing, the integration, the, all the hardware, but the reality of it is the, the customers. We're providing the service to the customers, and obviously NASA and commercial crew is one of those, but we are targeting other customers as well uh, from some of the countries like Brazil, Costa Rica, Australia, India, to name a few that we've been in touch with, because they do have interests in flying astronauts from their countries for their nation uh, on a system like Liberty can provide. Uh, the team of Liberty, uh, get the, the sound. Now we've got it. Thanks. So that was pretty fast and furious, uh, but what that tried to show is with Liberty, we do have hardware. And so the, the first stage, the five-segment booster, has been test-fired three times. The second stage is the core of the Ariane 5 that's flying. Next, our next discussion uh, is will be joined by Mr. Kent Rowinger from ATK. Uh, it will be sponsored by Liberty. The, Mr. Kent Rowinger is a five-time NASA, NASA shuttle astronaut. Uh, veteran, as well as having flown two as the mission commander, logging over 1,600 hours of uh, space travel. And well, I'm pleased to have us, him join us for this uh, great discussion on this new exciting thing. So we welcome to the stage. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. And, and I have one goal today, <clears throat> and my goal today is to just inform people what liberty is, what it's all about. And I think the best way for me to do that uh, is I've got some slides, I've got 30 minutes. And by the way, I was planning on uh, using no more than 20 minutes uh, for me to talk. And then what I would love is to field questions from the audience. Uh, because in inevitably, I'm not very good at picking